Hello and welcome to the About to Interview podcast. I'm your host, that guy named John. This is a supplemental version of the About to Interview podcast, which drops every Wednesday and covers movies, TV shows, film festivals, and more. You can follow the podcast on all forms of social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at About to Review. And make sure to subscribe on iTunes slash Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Blueberry, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. This show focuses solely on the conversations that I have with authors, directors, actors, and creators, and is available on YouTube as well as subscribing to the podcast. Make sure to click the subscribe button below, give a thumbs up, and check out the full show notes with links to the guests at abouttoreview.com. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Hey everybody, before we get into the actual interviews, I wanted to put out a little bit of a disclaimer. The second interview that you're going to listen to with Kira Zagorski and Patrick Sabungi, unfortunately there was a hardware malfunction and the last part of the interview was cut off. Uh, It totally sucked, we were having a great conversation (laughs) and I looked down at my recorder and it had stopped recording. So I tried to fix it, tried to work it together and then I tried to get together with them later on that weekend unfortunately we we're not able to make that happen so hopefully they will come back on at some point and we can finish our conversation so if you're wondering as you're listening why it kind of cuts off around you know a 10 minute mark of that interview that is why I totally apologize for that but without going into more of the mistake I will let you listen to all of the interviews with the amazing guests, and after that, I will talk about my favorites from each program, and then finally award my best of Vancouver Short Film Festival 2018. Sitting down with me now are the co-directors of the 8th Vancouver Short Film Festival, welcoming back to the show, Marina Dix. Hi. And welcoming for the first time, Zlatina Pasheva. Hello, thank you. So thank you both for taking time. We are sequestered in a quiet room, uh, which is rare right yeah, now at the Vancouver Short Film Festival. Place. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. And there may or may not have been some activities behind us involving a mystery and police. Ooh, Who knows? Yeah. Uh, tune in next week and we will have the answer <laughs> to that. Maybe not. Maybe. If there's a news report, we'll send it to you. <laughs> Possibly. This year, the Vancouver Short Film Festival, this is the eighth year. And Zlatina, I'm going to start with you, okay. mainly because everybody knows Marina. I I'm mean, like a celebrity. She is. Pretty much. Yeah. So <laughs> Zlatina, <laughs> no big this, deal. Is, this is your first year as co-director yes. for this particular festival. Mm-hmm. What about this year made you want to be involved with the Vancouver Short Film Festival? Um, well, Marina and Kristen actually invited me at the Crazy Eights Gala <laughs> this past year. If uh, Kristen was leaving her, her post and she mm-hmm. asked if I wanted to be director and I was like, hell yeah. And then I held a gun to her head and she was like, okay, I guess I'll do it. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't think we were going to talk about that, but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that's actually how it went down. <laughs> so no, I really wanted to work with Marina in a closer capacity and I love, I love this festival. I love the short films that we see from BC filmmakers. So getting more involved was a dream. Yay. Excellent. And Marina, of course, you have been involved with Vancouver Short yeah. Film Festival <laughs> for how many years now? I think it's four. Four years. I think I'm years. on my fourth year this year. Yeah. Varying capacities. I have not been director for of four course. years. <laughs> no. But, I mean, you keep moving up. Eventually, yeah. it might just be named the Marina Dix Vancouver Short Film Festival. The Marina's Latina Short Film Festival. <laughs> We're oh, starting well. a band. We're so, well, we, our names rhyme, so it would just make sense. It really does sound like a sweet band. Yeah. When I was first emailing with you guys a couple months ago, setting everything up, and I was getting excited about the festival, yeah. and I was being introduced to Latina, and I was like, Marina and Latina? Yeah, I was like, so, so are they back from touring Germany yeah. right now? Oh, I was my like, goodness, Germany would be her. our <laughs> fan base, for sure. It, <laughs> it absolutely would be. So this is now your your fourth year with the Vancouver Short Film Festival. Mm-hmm. 
how many films are showing this year compared to other years? Do you guys like to keep it the same number or is it something that you want to expand? Um, yeah, so I mean, we really only have one day and one night to show as many films as possible. <laughs> right. So um, this year uh, we do have a, we had a crazy increase of submissions this year. Really? And we had 183 submissions. Wow. Which we've, that's about 15 more than we usually get. And so we were like, what do we do with all these amazing films? How do we showcase more? And and so this year, uh, I approached Latina with an idea to do an After Dark screening so right. that we could fit as many as possible in, and but curate that more so to horror and thriller mm-hmm. filmmakers because ours is very um, non-genre, but we do have to satisfy quite a large audience. So how do you fit horror into that? doesn't necessarily always work so what we've done is this year instead of just having our regular competition we also Mm -hmm. added a curated program so that was really cool that was last night so we're all a little bit like not hung over but like (laughs) a little bit just tired it was was a long day for for a lot of people yeah yesterday i know that on friday i mean my travel day started like 6 a.m oh my gosh and then i was here at the theater until Midnight? Yeah, was yeah it? we got yeah, out of here mid- at midnight. Oh, yeah, because you were, somebody, we were somebody, I'm to not going to name names, was nearly physically pushing people out oh, of the theater at midnight. I pushed you out of the uh, theater. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I started singing Closing Time. No one got my right. joke. <laughs> That's what they do at bars. <laughs> we should just do that tonight. Yeah. Can we? <laughs> I think so. I and mean, when I was in theater, after we would wrap up our shows, one mm-hmm. of the things we would say, because the same thing would happen, mm-hmm. people would just want to hang out. Of course. Like, this is not Ferris Bueller's Day Off. There is no surprise ending. (laughs) Go the F home. Yeah. (laughs) But everybody, I knew everybody in the audience. So it wasn't like I was yelling at strangers. Exactly. So (laughs) as we are recording on Saturday, we just finished program two. Two. There are still three, two more. Two more. Two more left. Tonight, what would you say is kind of the biggest takeaway from the 2018 Vancouver Short Film Fest? Marina, go ahead. Oh, me first. Mm-hmm. Um, this year, uh, I really wanted to make sure that there was a real emphasis on filmmakers. Mm-hmm. Um, that was really important to me as as a filmmaker myself. When I go to film festivals, I've been to a couple um, that have just really made filmmakers such a central part of the festival, and it made it so um important to me and I made some really amazing connections all over the United States Mm -hmm. for festivals I've been to and so um, our mandate is to grow and foster the BC film community and so by doing so we created our first ever filmmaker luncheon Mm -hmm. which happened this morning and we had 50 filmmakers out wow we had a full (laughs) breakfast Um, it was sponsored or not sponsored but partnered Um, we partnered with Story Hive tell us Mm -hmm. and um it was amazing, and everybody stuck around. They, every, all the filmmakers were talking with each other. People from different filmmaking circles were interacting, and it was just, that's basically what this is for. Mm-hmm. Like a, a festival is just a massive networking event. It, yep. it, it offers you the opportunity for people to see your work. You get to see who's working. You get to see who's like coming up out of the ranks, Who's the, who are the students that are making an influence, and... Um, yeah, that that was the biggest thing for me that I saw that we were finally starting to really connect that to the filmmakers. And I think that was that for me was really exciting. And I think we're going to do more with that next year. Nice. So, expansion. <laughs> nice. And Zatina? Um, biggest takeaway, this year we saw a lot of female director mm-hmm. films. <laughs> um, I think we have 15 total female directors awesome. in the lineup. Um, so it's really great to see that. And next year, I'm hoping for more female cinematographers. That's my that's my dream. I mean, there is, the for the first time ever, which I, it baffles me every time this happens in like 2018. This is like the first female cinematographer is up for the Oscar. And it was like, how? In, in 2018, yeah. is that still a thing? But for Mudbound, yep. you know, mm-hmm. and so that being a goal for next year, I mean, that would be, that would be pretty incredible. I know. I just don't know how to reach them. How do we find them? Oh, we'll figure it out. Yeah. I yes. know two. <laughs> I know two okay. as well. It's crazy. Hey, four. All right. We four, know four right there. We're probably the same. <laughs> probably. <laughs> but yeah, we'll find them. We'll find them and we'll bring them up. We'll out. find them for sure. <laughs> so every year when I come up here, I mean, like Marino's saying, this is just a big networking opportunity. But one of the things that I love seeing is all of the collaboration 
is I will meet somebody at a different Vancouver film festival or a different film festival, come here and recognize that everybody knows each other, you know their work, you know what they're doing, mm-hmm. and that sense of community is always just inspiring. And so last night at the gala opening, and then I'm sure tonight after everything, before we get kicked out, <laughs> uh, you know, we will have another chance for everybody just to really get together and mm-hmm. meet each other. Uh, listening to students last night, um, the director from Violet in June, mm-hmm. you know, listening to her after the screening, talk to people and be like, okay, I'm, I'm graduating, I'm gonna be done with school, what should my next steps be? Mm-hmm. And her getting legitimate advice from people in the industry was pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. that's, that's such a beautiful thing. Like the Vancouver film community is, is has such a support system built into it. Mm-hmm. Um, we have like uh, programs like Story Hive through Telus. We have Crazy Eights. We have Hot Shots. We have all of these little um, like MPPIA award through Whistler Film Festival. All of these little awards here and there that have. Um, really brought our community. I mean, we're not that big of a community, so it's it. We are growing and mm-hmm. steadily increasing our numbers, but um, the independent community really bands together. For and sure. and it's events like this where you really see it, and you can and you can sort of feel the sense of community. You can't. I can't walk down that hall. Neither of us can without <laughs> being like stopped by five people right. <laughs> that we know and we've known for years. And this. Just they're they're still working, they're still creating, and it's it's really inspiring to see that the city just doesn't stop against all adversity, and they all come out to support each other's work. So, yeah, it's been it's been another really good year for that. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. And then to wrap up, since I'm sure both of you guys are going to be start getting pulled in like five different directions <laughs> yeah, again, like it? you are all weekend. <laughs> so, uh, moving forward. Mm-hmm. So in 2019, Latina gave her <laughs> proclamation of wanting to see more female cinematographers what is something when I come back in 2019 Mm -hmm. that we'll talk about then something that you want to see at that 2019 festival oh um I think next year um I think uh, we're looking at it like expanding like how do we expand our mentorship opportunities Mm -hmm. and and how do we create um, even more of a sense of community around these short films. I mean, short films are, are so hard to create. Mm-hmm. Um, they're such an expression of, of art in, in such a condensed form. <laughs> right. I, you'll talk to a lot of people who are very, um, like very precious over their films because you spend so much time trying to make them. Um, and uh, so I'm just, I, I, I really just want to create more opportunities for the filmmakers and Excellent. more of a community. And, it, um, and we've partnered with uh, Story Hive Tell us to do the luncheon. And I think next year we're going to partner to do um, a bigger uh, mentoring opportunities. Again. Nice. I don't know what that will look like now, but right. we've already <laughs> set up a meeting to talk about it because the luncheon was quite successful this morning. And, and so next year you'll be hearing about that because it will be happening. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, all right. So for both of you, so thank you so much for being co-directors of this amazing film festival for inviting me back. Thank you for uh, coming. This is my second year. Never Marina. leave us. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Please. I, I will keep coming back as long as the invitation is there. Of course. Uh, last year was Marina's first ever podcast. Yeah. This year was Latina's first Ooh, ever podcast. Thank uh, you. And then individually, if people want to follow you guys on social media and see the projects you are currently working on, where should they go for that? Check me out on Instagram at Little Z Productions. That's okay probably the best place to look for me yeah mine's just uh at one zero roses <laughs> you'll see a lot of pictures of me and my my partner <laughs> yeah mine's just me on our adventures <laughs> rolling around <laughs> on the floor mostly <laughs> i do i do tend to post uh, photos but um i'm not not that we need to be more active well, I, I think that's something twitter we can talk well. about next year is that zatina and i will have active I social have media twitter i have a thousand <laughs> followers on you hey, i have like go. 200 i manage five different accounts so the, <laughs> yeah that is that is madness i'm a bit yeah. schizophrenic Excellent. <laughs> well thank you both so much uh for taking the time uh, I will now release you back into the wild because as soon as you walk out of that door, mm, guaranteed go. somebody is going to be like, hey, we need to hear, hear, hear. Oh, yeah. So That'll be fun. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, Zlatina. Thank you. And thank I cannot wait so for much. the rest of the films. And this is a blast. 
Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you for coming. (laughs) Of course. In my makeshift studio at the moment, uh, in the quietest place in the entire building, (laughs) uh, I am with Kira Zagorski and Patrick Sabangi. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us. How did I do on the names? Perfect. I was I was waiting for it. I Nailed like, it. You even gave Sabongi a little, little French flair, which is uh, a little spicy. Much appreciated. Yeah. Oh, you know, I do what I can. Yeah. <laughs> Good man. Uh, so these two are from the incredible film The Prince. This is something that really resonated uh, with me. It tells a story of a man named Amir, who is an actor. If some of this is starting to sound, you know, autobiographical mm. uh, for for somebody that I'm interviewing, yeah. uh, and the difficulties of being someone of a different ethnicity than a lot of people in Hollywood and mm-hmm. the struggles that he had to come through. So tell me about kind of where that came from, even though I know the answer because the answer is life. Yeah. But <laughs> right. tell Experience. me just kind of about that process of writing this or kind of being in that, in that moment and being like, this is a story that is personal here it is for the world to see. Yeah. I'll let Kira talk about the writing part of it. Okay. I can talk about the uh, living through it <laughs> part of it. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an Egyptian uh, man uh, born in Canada. Um, and when I entered the film and TV industry in particular, um, it, as a young actor, you kind of have to take the jobs that you can get. Right. You know? and, and I'm from a very physical background, and I kind of gravitated towards action stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and... Uh, and um, right away it became evident to me that uh, actually once 9-11 happened, mm. there was going to be a huge market for villains in Hollywood who looked like me uh, and the villains that people would like to shoot and blow up and right. throw off of things. And so I did that for years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then as I got more mature and more uh, woke, can I say that? I don't know sure. if I'm too old to use <laughs> woke. But uh, there's an age. Uh, is there an age? Uh, yeah. about lit? <laughs> I'm not, I can't use lit anymore, maybe still woke. Um, As I start to become more aware of the world around me and how I contributed to the world around me, I I started to realize that I had to take responsibility for the stereotype that was propagated about people who look like me. Because I work in in entertainment and every time I take one of those roles, I'm supporting that stereotype. I'm propagating that stereotype. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what the film does is that, and that's a very small part you know, right. of, of the overall story. But Kira in her writing and her directing uh, was able to encapsulate so much of what we experienced and the, the not just the discrimination, but the hard uh, personal choices I had to make as an artist. Absolutely. Um, uh, on top of, you know, everything else that's crammed into the film is what is the artist's responsibility in the face of discrimination and social injustice? Mm-hmm. And how much of a say do we really have? You know, if I got to put food on the table... Uh, right. uh, and I'm, these are the roles I'm offered. It's great to be all noble and say, oh, I don't do that. But then mm-hmm. what? You know, I, I, this is my my career. Yeah. Um, okay. So living through that has been tricky. And making this film and having these conversations has been very therapeutic for me because I can uh, um, I can have these conversations and it's not just a whirlwind inside my head of guilt and mm-hmm. responsibility. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, in, in putting this story together, I think part of it was that, I mean, we, we've been together for a very long time. We were engaged before the events of 9-11. Mm-hmm. So we've been on this whole journey of how the world changed and it all happened yeah. and it affected our relationship. It affected immigration. You know, I'm American. He's Canadian. It just it, 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 it was so much a part of our lives right. and has been in just the way people would behave around him, the way I would step in, the way you witness the way you see things. And when I'm looking at the talent that he is as an actor and where he comes from and the way he he's from here and this whole idea of go back to where you came from, those kinds of things. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> he's got a master's degree. He's a highly trained actor. He can do so many things. And then, but this is the only thing that he even gets to be approached for mm-hmm. or even gets to get his foot in the door for. And it's, well, why not the lead though? How come? Right. Why why can't it be you? And so being having experiences, real life experiences like the the incident on public transit, mm-hmm. those types of things, to just set up the world in a story for the audiences to see, get a glimpse into the life of what it must be like for him. Um, but then 
I'm a witness to his life as well. So when he has these hard decisions, when he's coming home and his career has grown and he's having a hard time on set because nobody gets it and I'm trying to bring humanity to this character, he talks about this with me and we work through it together. Mm -hmm. And and it always comes down to you got to represent your culture. You know, you got to you got to stand up for yourself and you yeah. need to this is a, a moment for you. Yes, that's the showrunner of this really big show or that's a really, you know, intimidating director, but you are the only one that can speak on this topic truly. And mm-hmm. so this is an opportunity for them to learn something. And I've witnessed that so many times and and sometimes big moments where, you know, we have to put food on the table and there was one show and I remember we were in Brooklyn while Patrick was shooting Homeland and there's this audition that comes through and they keep kind of bugging him about they're Mm -hmm. really looking at you to read for this thing and it's just I mean I think it said in all caps um, angry brown men come and enter the room this kind of stuff (laughs) and it's going to be a huge show and it was one of those things where he's thinking it's a series regular Mm -hmm. it's it's a SAG deal it's US money I could probably get a lot like everything everything about it like that like I hadn't ever made money like that. Yeah. yeah. And it was this thing of we're looking at it. We're trying to find, is there a silver lining in this script? Right. Is there, because we know you're going to step in and do something with it. You're going to bring that at the end of the day, do actors have power to some extent, mm-hmm. but really this is what they want. They want this villain. They want the right. tw- twisty mustache thing. And I was there with him when we made this decision of you're not reading for that. Don't worry about it. Something else will come along. So, wow. um, that's basically where it came down to just the little things he comes home and oh yeah you know here i am playing this part this is what they do to people like me they they put dirt on your face because that that must be we're just dirty all the time people right. like me or you know oh you're from here that's such a surprise or just yeah. just the little details about if your beard is scarier so as i was putting this together and trying to write the story of a little girl who's like i'm gonna stick up for my uncle and show you that he's uh he's just like you and me and he's a prince mm-hmm. so you need to stand down you know <laughs> yeah. um and doing it through love because she's just such a big bright light in the movie. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot going on there, but just to show the subtle racism that happens, I think in a lot of people who deal with those things might be able to relate to the film. Yeah, uh, I am one of them. Mm. <laughs> I mean, just being somebody who is multi ethnic, mm. who gets confused for everything else. I like when I watched this the first time last year on my laptop. I, I cannot really accurately describe how uncomfortable I started getting while watching this because of reality, of situations that I have been in that were incredibly similar. And so just like, so for me watching this, I got it. Like, I mean, it was, mm. it is reality. And the other thing that struck me both times I have now watched it, the complacency mm. of society. Yeah. So when this is happening on the bus, this is an altercation happening that is an injustice and the way that you guys chose to show other people on the bus who then look away, who yeah. physically just like, uh, nope, I'm not involved with that. That complacency is something that as multi-ethnic people, we deal with all the time. Yeah. And so it was, it was very raw. It was very emotional. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when I was sitting here this time, I knew it was going to happen. I knew how things were going to turn out, but it still had that effect on me. And so that was really powerful. So thank you for showing uh, that message because I can tell people the stories that have yeah. happened throughout my life mm-hmm. and people will have that same reaction. Oh, that doesn't really happen. Yeah. Or I don't think it happened like that. Uh, yeah, it did. And it, it did. does. And so it seeing really, it on screen. It really sticks with you. Yeah. The, the <laughs> lack of engagement when something is going on and mm-hmm. the, to look for is there anyone who's going to say anything is there anyone else out there Th- those are the things that really have that it's it really struck me and when it happened to us and when it's happened on a number of occasions in different types of situations mm-hmm. when people just decide that this has nothing to do with me i yeah. can just walk away and i'm just going to go home and i'm not going to get involved and um look where we are today now politically and you know and yeah. and, and i think uh, in large part, the film uh, is for those people on the bus. You know, mm-hmm. if our audience is going to yeah. put themselves into the movie, they're not all going to identify with the mayor. Of course, most people are not going to identify with the racist guy on the on the bus. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe subconsciously, they'll identify and be like, "Oh, uh, <laughs> I'm the bystander on the bus, yeah. mm-hmm. and what am I going to do?" And it's not to blame them. No. I think it's it's a very hard position to be in. 
but, um, but at least to raise the aware. question for them and say, to be yeah. aware, mm -hmm. this stuff is happening. Yeah. And uh, you may be one of those bystanders on the bus. And what are you going to do yeah. next time? Lawrence Lalam, director and co-writer mm -hmm. of Cypher, is sitting down with me now. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So Cypher is something that I actually had the opportunity to watch uh, last year when it was part of the Crazy Eights Film Festival, which is a totally different film festival that is amazing and madness and the way that you guys are able to pull off these incredible films with what limitations you have is tremendous so cypher was that the first time it was played as part of the crazy it's last year yes yeah that was okay. the first time um so like crazy eights is vancouver's oldest and largest um film competition mm -hmm. and all a lot of vancouver filmmakers uh they submit their their story idea and if they get chosen it's like they have there's a three stages you have the top 40 and mm -hmm. then they have to do in-person pitches and then there's the top 12 and they have then they have to submit scripts and from those is a top six which is weird you know if it was called crazy eight you'd think there'd be eight I, yeah i was wondering but, that the first time like, but you when know, i first started getting those emails i was like one two three yeah okay. <laughs> but we get we have eight days to make it and right it's three days to shoot five days for post and then we have the big gala um which uh crazy eights does a great job of making it feel like it's the biggest thing happening around. Right. It's like, it feels like the Oscars and Emmys awesome. and it's all that. You, you, it's like you get the whole red carpet. It feels like, it, it feels, you feel great. You feel like it's, you've made it. <laughs> um, Excellent. <laughs> but uh, I mean, they really, and, but they, you know, they support up and coming filmmakers and, you know, some, some more established filmmakers. But uh, yeah, it, it's uh, one of those uh, great Vancouver film events that happens every year. From Crazy Eights to Now. One of the things that you and I were talking about off mic is that there's been a little bit of polish mm. done to the version that is playing this weekend when you had a little bit more time and not just three days to shoot and five days in post. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just so like five days to edit um, what ended up being a 20 minute film. It's just wow. it's maddening. And, you know, this is very, you know, we're we're we got to deliver the film and we're falling asleep and we're like, <laughs> oh, it's like four or five. We got to taxi over to the sound guy and we're just like making decisions and um you know like it, i think like during the gallop it was um well received but mm -hmm. you know I, I saw a lot of a lot of little things that we wanted to change and so afterwards after the the gala we we took some took our time to just you know add a little little tweak here and there okay make it a little smoother give it a little shine and you know yeah so give people the the breakdown for cypher cypher is a la 90s Hip hop drama set in post riot LA mm -hmm. in the nineties, um, sort of about the conflict between the Korean and the Black communities uh, that happened. That was sort of happening, but sort of set in and mm -hmm. around the underground hip hop uh, community, uh, hip hop underground hip hop scene. It was inspired by Tiger JK. Uh, who's kind of like I guess he's like the Jay Z. I've heard him been described by like the Tupac <laughs> of of rap in 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 Korea, of uh, Tupac of South Korean rap. Uh -huh. But I think he's more like the Jay Z of okay. of South, uh, of Korean rap because he's got uh, his wife uh, partner uh, Yu Yumari, I think his name, and they, they have they make they have this like kind of Jay Z Beyonce vibe about them. Okay. Uh, anyway, so he had a story where he grew up, grew up born in Miami, grew up in L A. and was there during the time of the riots and there was a lot mm. of tension and violence between the two communities. And so he tried to create rap as a way to um, bring the two communities together. And mm -hmm. we were just, uh, that that was actually um, our lead actor, Jerome Yu, who is also a co-writer along with uh, Natch Dutsumeda, the producer and uh, Copacetic, who's a battle rapper. Um, when we were writing this thing, uh, he, he, during research, it was originally set in like Oakland in 2000, the 2000s. And then, right. We came across the story. It's like, oh, it's great. We, we should. We got to talk to Tiger JK, mm -hmm. and we couldn't. Like, we reached out Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. <laughs> right. Just could not get a hold. I mean, he's like, he's kind of a big deal. So right. I, it, it would be hard. But um, we haven't had luck. So we kind of made a story inspired by that. Right. That character. Uh, but actually, at this film festival, at the Vancouver, at the twenty. 18 uh, Vancouver Short Film Fest. We met uh, with the makers of um, The Greatest Trick. I was chatting with him and he knows Tiger JK. 
Really? Yeah. And it was like, you gotta, you gotta hook us, you gotta, you gotta right. get us a connection. I gotta, you gotta send him this short. Uh, uh, so hopefully, yeah, it'd be great. I'd love to, I'd love to just hear his story and yeah. That and make sure that he gets a copy, make sure that he can get a screener exactly. and check it exactly. out. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So what in particular with this story, with the confluence of the Korean culture, the black culture in Oakland, you know, in the nineties, what about that really spoke to you? When we initially got together, uh, it was Jerome, Natch, and myself. Um, we were just fascinated by the whole new wave of Asian and Asian American uh, rap mm-hmm. coming out of, especially sort of Korean and North uh, uh, Korean and, <laughs> and Korean American. I was like, uh, wait, there were North Korean rappers <laughs> in this movie? That would be cool. I bet there. <laughs> You know, it's probably it's probably something going on there we don't know about yet. Oh, uh, there's a lot. Yeah, but I would love to see the North Korean rap culture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be pretty <laughs> fascinating. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Uh. Last year it was like sort of Keith Ape and Dumbfounded. All these sort of uh, Korean and, and uh, Korean American rappers were sort of coming on scene and mm-hmm. being um, welcomed in in North America. And yeah, we just wanted to explore the sort of asian american experience of of hip-hop and mm-hmm. we, we found it just really interesting because in that is it's like the confluence of, of two different cultures mm-hmm. um and uh but it's so uh, embedded in our our youth uh growing up with that music um mm-hmm. and yeah we so we just trying to find that that the story about tiger gk in 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 LA in the 90s was like the perfect vehicle for it. Now, in the film, there are a few performances. You know, there are these ciphers, these rap battles. So when that was happening, when those two actors are getting together, any cipher I've ever been to, you know, back in the day, things can get pretty heated. Uh, So even though this was a film and you have a whole set there, what was that energy like when you were filming those scenes? Oh, man. Um, It's pretty pretty incredible. And... and, uh a lot of credit can be given to Jerome Yu and Alex Barima, who are the two leads. Mm-hmm. Um, they really, uh, you know, Jerome, uh, Alex Barima in the, his casting, he was just, he was really good at rapping. He was, he had such a rhythm. And Jerome actually worked on a previous, my previous short film, um, The Blue Jet. Uh, he was in it as well, but mm. he had a, a smaller role. But I, knew, I, I cast him because he had, a, he had a lot of rhythm. Okay. But he couldn't quite rap. Uh, okay. But he really practiced so hard, and he became so good. Uh, and we had we we had brought on a battle rapper, Copacetic, who is also an actor, a local actor, and he's uh, he helped write the the rap battles. And so, um, if you seen the film, you know, it's mm-hmm. a little spoiler, you know, at the end there's a really a, a sort of a a big emotional climax, and yeah. and so. Um, you know, when we're once after all the rehearsal, the rapping was second nature to them. They were really, they were just in it. And then nice. just once you had all those people in that space, um, it, it just was, it was just fun. Uh, and it, what was interesting is when we did uh, a, uh, was it, um, just like a rehearsal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we just did a rehearsal of kind of going into the emotional scene. And it was like, they were so ready to just explode. They were just just like awesome stocked full of just emotion and when we did the rehearsal they like they started to, they cried and they're like and they're like why didn't you film that right um, <laughs> always and, keep filming yeah, yeah but i mean like it was the performances were great uh but it was like it was it was uh it's cra- i mean also because we're on a time crunch we don't have that much time yeah but um yeah they really gave a great performance and it was really f- like it was probably it was yeah the most fun i've ever had on set and um because it was like a hip-hop film we tried to mm-hmm. keep you know, we just try to keep it that energy aligned, and so Absolutely. you know, sometimes we'd have, you know, like the our DJ Myth, uh, the character DJ Myth OG, the, the narrator. He would mm-hmm. think there was a thing where he says his name, like DJ Myth OG, and it would be like OG. OG. <laughs> and so we did do that on set, you know, and it was just because I, I think uh, it's important to the energy on set is important, and mm-hmm. um, you know, trying to make that work environment, you know. Uh, as well as professional and safe, but also just like really great and energizing and just to, you know, I think that's, that's important. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. So what is the plan for the film now that it played last year as part of crazy, crazy eights, 
Now it's a little bit more polished, part of the Vancouver Short Film Festival. What is next? Yeah, I mean, we're hoping for it to continue its fa- festival circuit uh, run and hopefully it'll get into Busan or some someplace in Korea. Okay, yeah. Um, and uh, the, the the hope, and now this is now becoming a closer to reality, is to get it to J- Tiger JK cause yeah. I, because I, I think we're, myself and some of the other writers were, were interested in exploring his story mm-hmm. and maybe exploring, um, you know, the feature version. And, and, um, and, and so we were, that's why we really want to talk to Tiger, Tiger JK and hear about his, his, uh, experience in, in trying to create, uh, rap to bring the two communities together. What's mm-hmm. that like? You know, he made an album around that time called enter the tiger. Mm-hmm. And you, when you hear it, it's, it, it's, it's great. It's, it's, it sounds like, uh, a bunch of, uh, Korean and black kids getting high and rapping. It, it sounds <laughs> right. like a blast, but you know, I think there's a, I think there's a really great story there. That's, that's, that's just, it's just waiting to be uncovered. So, awesome. um, I hope we can get tiger JK to see the film and connect and, um, hear his here i think it would make a great vice story too it's just like a, yeah yeah for sure uh I, yeah i think it'd be great to get to really explore a story and maybe make a feature uh, okay. or at least have you know i uh, just have a great story you know hear a great story have a great story maybe tell it to some people you know that sounds good and then where can people follow both cypher on social media and you so that they can see kind of all of these mechanisms that are working and seeing that seeing what you're doing yeah, uh, I'm at uh, Lawrence Le Lam and on Instagram, and you can add me on Facebook, Lawrence Lam, and mm-hmm. Cipher uh, Cipher the f- at Cipher the Film okay. on Instagram or Cipher the Movies, one of those. Uh, I will put all of the links uh, in the show notes yeah. below. So excellent. Yeah, and um, you know we like to post up hip hop news and any sort of undercover underground stuff happening, and um, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you, Lawrence, for for taking the time uh, to be here. The film definitely is a good story that needs to be addressed, needs to be talked about. I mean, again, you know, it is 2018 and we are still dealing with so many issues that this film brings up. And these were things that happened, you know, almost 20 years ago. So thank you for making this uh, film. And I look forward to seeing kind of where it goes from here. I definitely think that, yeah, the, the Vice thing would make a fascinating story and i hope that everything works out with tiger jk dj myth og (laughs) og mayomi yoshida the director actor writer everything (laughs) with the amazing film akashi welcome to the show thank you thank you for having me did i miss any titles there as an independent filmmaker you always have to wear like 15 hats exactly yeah so that's enough (laughs) (laughs) okay (laughs) producer whatever whatever yeah all the things but with lots of people's help so of course yeah so your film akashi tells this beautiful and heartbreaking love story Mm -hmm. that is based on some real events, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. Based so can on you tell a little story. bit about kind of the reality of the situation and then mm. how you use that motivation in this film? The actual conversation between me and my grandmother happened like six years ago. Okay. Um, uh, I moved here from Tokyo seven years ago. Okay. So the character's journey is sort of similar to my own journey. Mm-hmm. And um, I came here specifically to pursue acting. So, um, yeah. And we had the exact same conversation. She was like, oh, I'm so proud of you. You're, you know, overseas. Mm -hmm. You're a woman. Like, back in the days, I couldn't do that. Or anyone couldn't do that. Yeah, because that is something that was touched on multiple times. Not to, you know, cut you off. But, yeah. yeah. Two different characters, both male and female Mm -hmm. in this film, make a point of that. Like, back in our days. And these are two older characters in the film. Yes, are saying like back in our day, like a woman traveling by herself, not only that, but just traveling to another country. Yeah, to pursue her, their dream. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and art, like mm-hmm. <laughs> it's kind of unheard of, which is kind of, I mean, this is side story, but my- uh, I welcome side stories here oh, on the great. About to Review podcast. Oh, beautiful. So. <laughs> um, my, so that gram, that my father, it's my father's side's grandmother. Okay. But her eldest sister, is actually one of the very few fashion designers that traveled to Paris right after World War II. Oh, wow. So she, 
um, I th- but she was the, I think, she, yeah, she's, oh, she's the second. My grandmother is the second youngest of eight sisters or six. <laughs> you know, they're back in the days. They just said, right. just pump it out. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, so the eldest actually was, so I'm kind of following sort of her path. Mm-hmm. And she's been kind of saying that, that like, oh, maybe like, maybe you're inspired secretly. I don't know why, but like some sort of way you're re- kind of following her path because she took the same uh you know career path where she pursued it outside Mm -hmm. of japan anyways um but uh when i moved here one of my biggest culture shock was the dating scene really yeah and also that and also um how many people don't have parents that are together right everybody's separated or um they've never met their parents mm-hmm. or they've just always had a single mother or a father. Right. So that was quite a shock to me that, cause my, my parents are still together and, um, yeah. So I was almost like one of the minorities who had parents that are together. Hmm. Cause you know, in acting classes we do exercises and then we reveal our vulnerable truth right. or whatnot. And that's sort of what came up a lot. And then, so I told my grandma when she was telling me, Oh, it's incredible what you're doing. I was like, grandma, you two stayed together until grandpa died. That's mm-hmm. unheard of. Well, not unheard of, but like this right. is, it's rare nowadays. Yeah. And so she was like, yeah, but we were different. You know, we were in arranged marriage. And so that's sort of the same conversation that we had. And then, um, yeah. And so what inspired me to write it was how interesting it is now and back in the days. We sort of... Uh, it's, the grass is always greener on the other side. We think that, oh, well, mm-hmm. back in the days, you, you were, and I, I, my character also talks about, like, we have so many choices. Like, do you think it's harder? And then grandma's like, well, maybe it was better in our time. Or like, it, it is right. hard when you have so many choices. Like, mm-hmm. it's kind of like, I mean, it's such a 21st century complaint. But <laughs> <laughs> right. I have so <laughs> many like, oh options. Oh, my God. Oh. What am I going to do? <laughs> right. But it's a real thing, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, there are, because there are so many, like, um, you get you kind of get lost of yeah. like well where do i want to go where do wh- there's so many ways to live my life how, how how am i supposed to choose one or do i as i'm choosing one can i switch to another you just don't know yeah. well and it is similar to one of this one of the philosophies mm-hmm. called decision exhaustion oh so steve yeah, jobs so, yeah wore light jeans and a black turtleneck yeah every day Cause he, and he talked about decision decision exhaustion. He was yeah. like, I have to deal with so much on a daily basis. Every day when I get up, mm-hmm. this is exact. This is one decision I never have to worry about. I wear this, and then he just does that. That's goes on so with his day. Interesting. So that type of thing, where yeah. whether it is the dating scene, whether it is all career of these choices, career choices, like just, yeah, marriage, kids. You look all those around, things. and especially in 2018, when we have the world at our fingertips, mm-hmm. and we can see what everybody is up to all the time. Totally, yeah. Before you take that first step and like, okay, where am I going to go to lunch? Let me pull up this, 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 mm-hmm. this. So you kind of wonder like maybe, and a lot of people say like, oh, it must have been simpler back in the days. But like my old, the older generations mm-hmm. be like, no, you have so many choices. You're so, right. so that contrast was really interesting to me. And also how emotionally detached we are sometimes nowadays yeah. because of uh, how much um, freedom we have, mm-hmm. but because we have that freedom, we also limit ourselves. We have control of what kind of limitations we give to ourselves. Yeah. But back in the days, there was already a limitation, so there was no, you know, multiple <laughs> limitations. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So they had no choice. So that the, that contrast was always kind of it was very tra- fascinating to me. Of like, why do we why do we think that it's better? But also like. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, that was what inspired me to write the script okay. and the story. Now, when you're writing the script, mm-hmm. did you know from the beginning that it was going to be in Japanese for the most part? Mm-hmm. Or was that something that just kind of through the creative process, you were like, this is something that is important? The play version mm-hmm. is actually kind of like 50 50. Okay. Um, ideally, I want it all to be in Japanese. But finding Japanese actors in Vancouver is pretty hard. <laughs> right. And also finding like the right right actors. Like there's yeah. there are Japanese actors, but you know, sometimes you just 
there's a a certain quality to one character For and sure. you can't you know it's casting's casting makes 90 percent of the film i think uh, absolutely right so <laughs> regardless um, of the project i think all of us know yeah films, tv shows web series where it is like yeah the show itself might not be that great but that one character is phenomenal absolutely <laughs> and it works on the flip side too yeah because sometimes one person could be so talented mm-hmm. and so you know just the best actor ever mm-hmm. But they're just not quite right. Yeah. And anyway, so um, the play version was 50-50. But ideally, I did want it to be in Japanese. And I was, I thought, well, it's 10 minutes. So like, I'm going to try and do it in Japanese as possible. And I was mm-hmm. very lucky to find the cast that we got. And they're phenomenal. So, right. yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, as far as the characters. Oh, oh actually. Yes. Uh, Linda, who played the lover at the yes. very end. Um, she's Japanese heritage, mm-hmm. but she can't speak Japanese. So we mm. initially had a little line, mm-hmm. but I cut it out. But it actually worked out without dialogue. Yeah, I totally agree. It yeah. made it made as much impact without words mm-hmm. than I feel like you know. Even if because it sounds like she had one line, you know, in the original script. So take that out. I think that silence really yeah. benefited the film, especially in the moments that she was in it. It resonated. It made sense mm-hmm. because it was at a somber moment of that reflection. Of yeah. You recognize, you now know exactly who this woman is and what totally. she meant to both people. Yeah. You know, and that's that a great example of casting that, I mean, I'm not, not to toot my own horn, but like, <laughs> she's, she was just so, um, like, the like the facial lines of the, the, uh, because of her experience in life yeah. it just shows how much she's gone through absolutely and you can't you can't really you can't fake that right. you can't do that in acting the 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 beautiful lines that she has in her face is just mm-hmm. that already tells what the character yeah. has gone through or like who she could be and that's all up to the audience but um and i think because we didn't have dialogue uh we were able to let the audience decide who she could be. Yeah. That was, I mean, it was a really amazing choice. Thank you. Uh, now in this 10 minute, you know, film, mm-hmm. if I were to kind of break this down to the three act structure, what I noticed in the first two acts, when you're going from flashback mm-hmm. to modern times, there was only music mm-hmm. in the flashbacks and not kind of in the modern pieces mm-hmm. until, you know, got towards the end of the film when it was, more incorporated into the general storyline. Yeah. Music is a huge thing. Whenever I, most, yeah, all of my favorite films Mm -hmm. have extraordinary score. And we, uh, Huao, he's our um, composer Mm -hmm. and he is incredible. He actually found us on Facebook because he worked with someone he's he's not from here. Okay. So uh, we, all our communication was on Skype. And he's from different countries. So, okay. um, but he found us, and he's he showed interest. And I even writing the script, the original play as well. I always had one music that I listened to. Okay. And that was sort of like the driving force of what this script, the film, the energy is kind of like. It's all in this one song. So I sent him that song to him, mm. and then he was like, "Oh, I get it." I, I, I know exactly awesome. what you want. And then from there, he's able to draw the inspiration yeah. and create the score for this. Yeah. So every, most of the scenes that we talked about, like this scene, we, so um, there's that main score, but mm-hmm. this one's more bare and just minimal. Right. And then we get, as as the the emotion of the film gets heavier and heavier, we'll add more. So gotcha. at the beginning, it's more lighter. Mm-hmm. It's kind of um, just like just simple piano, not very, you know, strings and all that. We didn't really have those. Um, But and that was both of our ideas of like and it was just it was natural. It just came up and was like, yeah, that's perfect. We both want that. Um, Was that the question? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Okay, great. (laughs) I hope I answered. But yeah, music is um, and if you haven't heard it, uh, it's the, the the music that I sent him mm-hmm. is Aqua by Ryuichi Sakamoto. Okay. If you have the chance to listen to it, it's on YouTube, but it's a beautiful song. And I, I every time I hear it, I can't I can't help but tear up. I just yeah. 
Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> so last question to wrap yes. things up. So the film ends with just one line of dialogue saying, I'm home. Mm -hmm. To you, what does home mean? That is a brilliant question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was uh, the biggest uh, question for like years in my life. Mm. And actually, um, maybe like four years ago, I was taking a voice class, okay. voice and movement class mm -hmm. as an actor. And then, because I've been, just a brief history of my life. Uh, I was born in Japan. From two to five, I was in Washington, D.C. My dad's a journalist, so we mm -hmm. traveled around. And then from five to nine, I was in Japan. Then from nine to 12, I was in Belgium and Brussels. Wow. And 12 to 24, I was in Tokyo. And then from 24, I've been living in Vancouver. So home has never, I've never had an a, a, a long enough experience to one place even though I've lived in Japan for the longest time mm -hmm. I'm I know I'm Japanese and I know that's my heritage right. and that's that's my nationality but I've never had that sense of home to Japan which mm. is very odd because my entire family's there right. and everybody's Japanese and then um, and probably because I've been moving around and then uh, I was taking this voice class and then we were doing like, you know, heavy breathing and like just, mm -hmm. you know, all those voice exercises. And then suddenly I hit one note and then, um, and it's not like singing voice. It's like, ah, mm -hmm. oh, kind of mm -hmm. just normal voice exercise. And then, um, voice, more voice inflection and not really tone. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then, uh, the, uh, mentor was like, oh, his name's David Smuckler. Mm -hmm. Amazing, amazing. He's a legend. Shout out to David Smuckler. Shout out David <laughs> Smuckler. <laughs> National Voice Intensive. Um, he said, oh, oh, wow. That's where it is. That's your home. And I'm like, wow. what? <laughs> no, it's not. And then mm -hmm. he's like, well, okay. But I don't know. I heard something and I instantly realized wow. that something, there was something different. And I got so upset because I didn't realize it. And I was like, how do you know? You don't know me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how do you know that this is my home? I don't know where it is. Wow. And then as the week went by to like, because it was like a five week intensive, I realized that um, suddenly this thing kind of th that specific sound, suddenly I felt connection to land. And, and I've never, ever felt that before. And so now I, I I'm, can proudly call Vancouver my home, probably because mm -hmm. I made it my home. Yeah. I've sort of, I mean, I came here by myself, and now I have my own Vancouver family. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, and, I mean, this this community is so loving. and It is amazing. Right? Every time I come up here, I am... Oh, where are you from? Seattle. Get out! Yeah. What? So yeah, Seattle's every, also great. It is, and we have an amazing film community down there. Right, we're and screening I, next month in Seattle. Oh, really? Yeah, Seattle. Perhaps Asian we will film do uh, part two of oh, of this interview. Unfortunately, uh, oh, come I'm doing. On. I'm so sorry. We have a different screening on in Vancouver for mm -hmm. a different film, so I can't be there. So you're choosing Vancouver over Seattle? Rude. Okay, <laughs> I see how it is. Just because you just went on this beautiful diatribe about how oh Vancouver is home. Oh my god! Oh my god! But Seattle is great too. Uh, but yes. So Van yeah, Vancouver is now feels like that that home that you have totally. been. It sounds like searching for and not really knowing mm -hmm. what it was for a long time. Yeah. So Excellent. that's home. But okay. also you find home in like people. Of course. Yeah. Now with the other than film screening in Seattle. Yes. Coming up. Yes. So what are, what are the next plans for Akashi? Akashi was part of NBC Universal Short Film Festival okay. this year and... Uh, um, I was very fortunate to win Outstanding Writer in that festival. Congratulations. Thank you, which has opened up like uh, very interesting doors. Um, they hooked me up with a manager and um, uh, an agent there. So okay. I got signed uh, with Gersh Talent Agency, which is great. And so we are talking about uh, the feature version of Akashi. Um, we have I have the play, so turning mm -hmm. that into the feature is kind of like what I'm working on right wow. now. Okay. Yeah. And then in the feature version, or hopefully what I would like to do is to, um, at least in the play version, we see more of 
more, a longer conversation, like another 20 minutes of grandma and grandchild talking about grandpa and all okay. the other things. And then uh, we get to see um, Kana's modern day, um, uh, act- her, her love life, actually. How, and it's actually after grandma passing away. So what happens gotcha. after okay. she passed away? And we also see grandpa's uh, love affair. What happened? Okay. What actually happened there, and di- how did it uh, either end, or mm-hmm. you know, how how did it blossom? What? How did they make that decision of separating? Um, so yeah, we get to see that uh, gener- different di- different generation, different time. But I guess again, hopefully, we get to accomplish that universal story still. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. And then, where can we will follow the project? On social media, where can they follow yeah. you and the things that you are up to? Um, I I'm on social media. All of it is I am M Y Y O U M E. I'm Mayumi. <laughs> okay, I will make sure it is in the show notes. I'm Mayumi. Yeah, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. I have my own Facebook page, and then Akashi has all that too. Twitter, Excellent. Facebook, Instagram. Um, Akashi screening in Vancouver again in March 11th. And then uh, we still have festivals coming. We just, yeah, hopefully we get to screen in Seattle again. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I was so bummed when I heard the date and I was like, no. Okay. Excellent. Well, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, the film is is beautiful. Thank it you. is just very sentimental, very loving. And I could tell that it comes from a place of just true passion and dedication. Thank so, you. Thank you, Mamie Yoshida, and all of the links will be in the notes below. Great. Thanks for listening. (laughs) The one, the only, (laughs) David C. Jones. That's me. Uh, welcome to the show. You are the MC extraordinaire. Oh, gosh. of, Of this event that I have been covering for two years now. When did you first get involved with the Vancouver Short Film Fest? I think when I heard you were coming to cover it, I begged to MC it. I mean, uh, it's right. flattery will yeah. get you everywhere Yay. on this podcast. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I MC a lot of stuff in town. And often what happens is people see me at an event and then they go, hey, we want some of that over here. And <laughs> some of that. <laughs> some of that. Whatever that is. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I do believe I've only done two years at this festival. Okay. Uh, I could be wrong. I often see that actually when people are booking me and they go, could you do the thing you did last year? And I went, what did I do? <laughs> sure. I do a lot of different <laughs> right. things. Right. And I, um, so, yeah, I, uh, I think two years. Okay. That was a long answer. <laughs> totally fine. Yeah. Uh, the, po- the About to Review podcast is known for long answers. Okay. So totally fine with that. Welcome. <laughs> so with this, what is it about the Vancouver Short Film Festival that want you know that made you want to come back and not just me well uh well one of the things that i love about uh short films for, like because myself i've made short films the short films are usually about a, a way of people uh ex- exercising their creativity mm-hmm. exercising their vision and and trying and cutting their teeth often yep. like they're figuring out how to make films so um i know speaking from experience uh, like I, I did many of the things that the filmmakers here are doing. I just did my moving master shot, right? Where mm-hmm. it was one whole long take. I shot a film on Super 8. Wow. I did a, f- I did a musical, right? I Amazing. Did all, I kept doing all these. I did. I directed a piece that someone else wrote, which was hmm. a, a, new, a different challenge. Yeah, right? for so sure. I'm interpreting your script. Um, so seeing the visionaries here, and one of the things that blows me away is they're way better than I ever was. <laughs> All right. They, they, the, some of the films have been outstanding. Tremendous. And, and, and yeah, and, and so many different ways of telling a story. So that's what makes it very exciting okay. to visit a, a, a short series. Mm-hmm. I, I, at all the festivals, I go to the shorts, I, I seek them out because. There, it's a roller coaster. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Mm. <laughs> All within uh, 10 minutes. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. So as a filmmaker mm. yourself, mm. what inspires you when it comes to film? I usually think of what will be interesting as a story for an audience. Okay. Or sometimes I give myself an artistic challenge. Mm-hmm. Right. So you actually, I will say a lot of times it started as an artistic challenge first. Like yeah. when I entered and got accepted into the Super 8 Festival, mm-hmm. 
It doesn't exist anymore. Uh, okay. But, uh, uh, and it's not Super 8 because it's really old. I was, was going to say. Mm. It was a 2013 <laughs> this Super came, 8 this festival. This came after the Real to Real Festival yes. that you were in. <laughs> yeah, uh. exactly. I wasn't doing when Super 8 was around. <laughs> right. Uh, and uh, so I went to that and I pitched and then I thought of a story that I wanted to tell in that using Super 8. So sometimes okay. it's the, the, the challenge first. Same thing when I went, I want to make a musical uh, right, I which say. is no small feat. No, it wasn't. Doing like there was a a musical number in one of the shorts of this Today, program. Yeah, uh, send us your smokes. Yeah, it was awesome. Even that is challenging. Like doing a musical number, and you had this idea to do a musical. Well, and I, I my film same boat uh, is what it was called. It won an award and everything. Congratulations! Yeah, thanks. Um, it uh, uh, it was also about two um, musical lesbians who keep cutting each other off. Hmm. So they're uh, having a fight. And so they start to sing a song and the other one cuts them off. So we actually had to write 14 songs oh my gosh. that you only get to hear about six to 10 seconds of each song. <laughs> okay. They sing one song all the way through. Mm -hmm. That's when, well, I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but they sing one song all the way through together as a duet. Um, and it, it, the audience finally goes, oh, now we can hear her whole song, right? Gotcha. Yeah. Is that available for people to view online? Only the trailer is still available at this point. So gotcha. So I'm, I'm trying to make some money off it. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's the challenge of short Wait, films. filmmakers want to make money? They what? want Whoa, to try. I know. <laughs> I know. In, in Canada, uh, uh, of course, we all try to get it to the mother corp. Right to the CBC, mm -hmm. so I mean I'm trying to get it in through the door there. Okay. Please give me money and show <laughs> right. it. Would you show this on your TV show, please? Me, me make good film. <laughs> me make good film. It won award. It won there, award. There you go. Please. Uh, and then once if CBC goes no, <laughs> then I'll put it online. But right now you can watch the trailer. Okay. If you type in "same boat official trailer," gotcha. Right. And probably have to put my name, David C. Jones. David C. Jones, right. of course. And then you can find the trailer. And the trailer will give you a, a, a sousson, a taste, a, mm. a, an appetizer okay. of the full film. Yeah. Very nice, very nice. Yeah. So with your MC duties that you do all yeah. around yeah. town, uh, you made a mention earlier tonight, actually, of previously doing street theater. I did. I've done so many <laughs> things. I did do, uh, when I was younger, I did street theater, uh, mm -hmm. uh, mostly in Vancouver and up in Whistler. Okay. Uh, developing shows. I don't know how to juggle our unicycle, so we did improv on the street. Nice. Uh, not a lot of people do that. I no. know why. Mm -hmm. It's hard. <laughs> it's exhausting. Uh, I'm an improviser also by trade. and uh, uh, By trade, that's a weird thing to say. <laughs> I made money at it. <laughs> right. I made okay. a lot of money at it. You could uh, say by profession. By profession. Uh, you know. Okay. And uh, uh, yeah, so I did street theater uh, for a while. I, li I like acting. I like performing. Mm -hmm. and I like audiences. Uh, so that's why I, I, I could not tell <laughs> uh, when you get up there you were just very deadpan yeah you know yeah. Uh, 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 I like to make sure they're having a good time they mm -hmm. know what's going on they know what's happening I like to inform them and I like to make them giggle mm -hmm. so I do a lot of auctions people hire me to do really? auctions for fundraisers because same the same thing uh, I, I really like people mm -hmm. and often at auctions only six people are bidding right so I try to keep them all laughing Mm -hmm. So that the ones who aren't bidding at least are having a good time. Okay. Right. So it was a pseudo comedy show slash auction. Exactly. So I'm not one of the ones, 45, 50, 50, 55, 60, 60, right. 65, 75. <laughs> I don't do that stuff. So what would you say has been the main path of yours, whether, you know, from the street theater to filmmaking, uh, what would you say is the main thing my, that has driven my you? My main path as an artist has been haphazard at best. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I just jump around to things that interest me. So mm -hmm. like, uh, uh, someone said, do you have any goals? And I went, just to keep having fun. <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, that works. Uh, like I, I directed the Canadian premiere of Heather's The Musical. Awesome. Right? So that was a big epic thing. Uh, then uh, I've acted in shows. I did my first Shakespeare show. Hmm. Uh, I was in Twelfth Night earlier. Okay. Uh, uh, I've just been approached to direct a Neil LeBute play. Um, um, and then uh, I just finished filming a short where I had to play a guy who put a gun in his mouth and was trying to kill himself. Ugh, okay. Right? So if you want to see something eclectic, I'll just I'll just make your listeners keep looking stuff up on the <laughs> right. tube of you. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you can type in David C. Jones demo reel. 
Nice. And you got 2014 and 2016, I think. And okay. I like to act. And I just like so to do fun stuff. is basically that, you know, being fun, challenging yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just keep growing. I, mm-hmm. I'm a teacher as well, and I always say to them, as an artist, you always have to be filling your artist toolbox, which is your brain and your creativity. So mm-hmm. you just need to go. I, I see lots of stuff. I'm always going out to shows, to movies, to theater, and uh, um, and uh, movies occasionally. Don't watch a lot of TV, actually. I like to get out. Okay. Right? And and then when I'm not doing that, I'm creating. I, I, I even create cabaret characters. I have, I <laughs> of have, course, yeah, of course you do. <laughs> I, I have a character named Bobby Beetle. I'm Bobby Beetle, and he was a big, big star from 1983 to mid 1983. <laughs> and nice. he sings a medley of his songs, "Bongo My Tiddly Bits." Mm-hmm. Um, uh, loves, uh, 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 what is it? Oh, I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> dance, dance Snake. There we go. Dance Snake. Mm-hmm. Have to find it again. And need to guess. Um, okay. Uh, another character named Sandra Veranda, who is a l- lesbian who came out in her fifties, and she's um just looking for the right woman. <laughs> and uh, I also have this French guy uh, that I just recently started doing. It's like, I am called the sac de- derrière, and I am. Uh, you know how the people who judge the movies or judge the plays or judge the books, I judge the people. <laughs> you know, and you say, "Why well, do this?" It's because I'm a dick basically mm-hmm. and then he has a song that he does nice so, yeah i yeah, like amazing no. a yeah. man a man of several talents or a, ma- a master talents. of none right <laughs> <laughs> fantastic I, I love that show by the way master of none yeah yeah uh and then where can people follow all of your, your all of adventures? my misadventures <laughs> uh uh on social media uh i it's I am David C. Jones. Mm-hmm. I have a website, uh, which is davidcjones.ca. Okay. If you go to davidcjones.com, you learn how to quit smoking. It's a different guy. <laughs> okay. Not that my website says light up. Right. Right. It's mm-hmm. just if you, and if you need to quit smoking, and you should, I'm an ex-smoker. I smoked for 10 years, a pack a day. Wow. I've been clean for 20, so I'm very Congratulations. Judge- Thank that you. was amazing. I'm very judgmental of smokers now, <laughs> and I have the right to be. Yes, right. you do. I, if they're smoking, I go, you're weak. <laughs> right? <gasps> I, I quit. You can too. You can too. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, the website, davidcjones.ca, has interesting things on it. And um, yeah, there you go. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, we tried to do this last year, and of course, this whole weekend flies by. I still cannot believe that it is almost over so thank you for I taking know. the time to sit down it no is worries the end of the festival you have been working your butt off so i really <laughs> appreciate it thank you again david c jones thank you very much <laughs> sitting down with me now is team luchagor and i said team but you guys are i Lu- love it team works luchagor so Gigi, renar matthias Matthias. <laughs> no, it's perfect. I was like, Matthias. oh, I was like, oh, Matthias. you gave me a Matthias. face again, <laughs> Matthias. Matthias. Tomato, tomato. <laughs> Rainer. <laughs> I like yes. Renoir. Renoir. Ooh, Renoir. That's what he said. Renoir. Right. It sounds actually Shut better than Renoir. Renoir. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, Renoir. So, uh, Luchagor, you guys were presenting one of your films, Bestia, That's as right. part of the After Dark screening. Mm-hmm. So, L- Luchagor, in general, you guys do straight horror, all of your films. Yes. Not most of well, our stuff, I guess you could say, has been horror. Okay. But uh, I guess if you want to conflicting like, say, opinions. Well, no, no, we've transitioned out slowly. Um, I wouldn't even consider Bestia like a traditional horror. Well, I mean, that. We, we I guess slowly... to answer the question is, Duchigor does genre films. Yeah, genre films. Genre okay. Genre films, mostly mm-hmm. horror, but to and make it more specific, one. Latin horror, I guess. Okay. Latin horror, and then our most recent one, you know, is kind of going off the beaten path from what we normally do, So, which is, you know, an undertaking and a challenge. On the most recent one being Bestia or something else that no, we have not the, seen? No, the, the series that we made last year. Okay. Um, La Quinceanera. Let's say that'd be the most non-horror. <laughs> Has horror elements of it, but truly in, 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 in the series itself, it's not considered a horror. Mm-hmm. Okay. So with Bestia, so how about we go around the table and talk about kind of what specifically drew you to Bestia and how you decided to frame it and go about it. Gigi, start. Um, well, for me, it started because Rainer showed me a picture of this location. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, just the picture in itself of the 
location was so magical and just the character on its own mm -hmm. that it was just such an amazing opportunity for the team uh, after shooting La Quinceña, the big Warner Brothers right. show, just to get back to our core roots, you know, and and just shoot something with the with a skeleton crew in this incredible location. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we wanted to do something different, not only just filming outside, but something a little more psychological. And, and I really wanted to experiment with the imagination of audiences. Right. And I think people's interpretation can be a lot, a lot scarier than what is presented on screen. For so sure. that's what I really wanted to do with Bestia, give everybody an ending that could make everyone think something totally different from the other person and just something a little more internal uh, with the character, the atmosphere, the location. Um, so for me, what drew me right away was just the picture of the location. Fantastic. Yeah, I think I, adding on top of what Gigi said, it pretty much was the location kind of played its own character right. uh, along with Matthias in, in, in the short film. And I think, like again, when I knew about this location from years back, um, you know, this is going a long time ago, but I used to go up there with my friends and I just always thought it was a beautiful place and mm -hmm. it was just like something should be told here. And like, again, we finished, we wrapped up the series and, you know, looking for, you know, something different and, and something that we could just do at our own pace. And right. Obviously it was around the time of that huge winter storm we had and, you know, that faced its own kind of repercussions, but we managed to do it. And I think that was a challenge on itself. <laughs> yeah, right. dangerous the, location to filming, get to, but filming, worth it. Filming, uh, you know, with Matthias in the cold and, you know, he really wanted to, uh, you know, suffer through it and be that character, which he did. Um, I, I think it was just, you know, it was great. It was great to be able to do that. And um, it just really pulled itself together. And I think the forest itself has its own eeriness mm -hmm. uh, along with, you know, the, the way Matthias is acting and the cinematography and all that. We obviously wanted to try to play in with natural light, uh, something Luke always wanted to do. He's not here right now. Um, but um, I think that was something that we always we want to push ourselves, basically, and try Very something cool. different. And I think we accomplished that. Sounds <laughs> and, good. And push ourselves to the next level. And then uh, Matthias, the star of a well, bestia. I don't know about star. But yeah. How, why do you not think <laughs> you are the only one in the movie? Yeah, come <laughs> <It's> on, <like> man. <laughs> If, if, any, if anyone else gets top billing on IMDb, we have oh, a different yeah. set of problems. <laughs> it could have been the forest. The, the yeah. forest, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> the tree. So, Matthias, with this, when did you come into the filmmaking process? Was it when you first saw oh, those imagery? I sent you the script. Oh, yeah, you said, like, oh, I wrote the script. I want you to read it. And, like, let me know what you think about it. Mm -hmm. So I read it. I'm like, oh, this is pretty good. So, I like, this is for me, right? And she's like, no, no, no. I picture, like, <laughs> this white dude. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. First of all, you're Latino. You gotta like right. support the Latinos here. Mm -hmm. So this guy must be like Latino. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, Pretty oh, much no, is what he said. Fit, right. Doesn't fit with the script. I'm like, I'm gonna make it fit. Don't worry about it. And they didn't want me like, cause I've never done something like that. And that's that okay. was my goal, like to challenge myself mm -hmm. to do something different. Cause I always play the bad guy. So it's like, I'm like, I want to do something different for sure, which is totally different than what I've ever done. And after like begging for a few weeks. Okay, <laughs> five days. <laughs> right. <laughs> so for one week of begging, they gave me the part, and I was very happy. And just being like in that forest and stuff was like very, very, very. Like uh, I didn't have much to like act. I just felt like, like the character. Oh wow! It was very, yeah. very, very interesting. I, I liked it a lot. Okay. Yeah, your transformation. I think Matias's transformation really impressed everyone on the team. On the mm -hmm. day, like the fake beard, the, the hair, like everything. He doesn't even look at all. Like a lot of people watch Bestia and they're like, that's Matias? Right. What? <laughs> um, and it was super cool to hear Matias be not, I wouldn't say begging like he was saying, mm -hmm. but like be so into a script that he's like, I want to do this. Uh, okay, maybe that, that, that sounds like begging. Uh, yeah, but, but, drunk, but, but he was, okay. and he was drunk too. But he was like, "I want to do this. This is something I've always wanted to challenge myself with." So it was so cool to hear that, and he, like Rainer and I were just really pumped to see something totally different. I think he totally pulled it off, and yeah, we're excited for whatever's next. Very cool. One of the things that I thought was you know, really special about the film is the sound design especially because the cinematography and the directing was so just up close and personal, but the sound design, the way that it kind of wrapped around you as you're watching it, pulled you into Matthias's performance. So the sound design, 
who can I give credit to for that? You can uh, give credit <laughs> to. Uh, we've been working with these guys for a few a few years now, and they're so amazing. Uh, yeah, Lex Ortega, uh, Luis Flores, and I think they just recently brought on another guy named Gus, Gus. Cuevas. Yeah. Okay. Um, but from Mexico City. From Mexico City. So nice. they've, they've been working with us for a few years. And these guys, just, they just know horror. Um, mm-hmm. they, just, they just know how to really pull the essence of what you're trying to show on, uh, you know, visually and, and enhance that even more. And it's just something that, you know, we just kind of give to them and give them a little bit of notes on kind of where we're feeling. And, and Gigi will kind of discuss certain beats and all that stuff. And, and they just take that and then they enhance it. And half the time, they only had like one change or two changes on them. It was kind of mm. like where the the sound of the yeah. this 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 mysterious scr- howl was coming from. But, right. Um, they just they, they just they, have this other element, like this other mind that understands the genre. And um, yeah, working with their their team's called LSD Audio. Okay. Mm-hmm. And just everything I've seen them do on features and shorts, it's it changes everything. It, the moment that Lex and Luis send the f- their first uh, attempt. It's mm-hmm. always like, whoa! Yeah. And oh then my god! As the like, as the creator and producer, you have yeah. to be like, all right, we cannot say we cannot tell them it is perfect the first time. So let's give them so, one. So, right. note. Yeah, yeah, we have to give them like, <laughs> but, you know, um, oh, let's just tone that one sound. But, down. but Bestia <laughs> right. was a really was a really interesting change because I think it was the closest that ever Lex and Luis worked with our composer <clears throat> Chase. Yeah. Oh, okay. Done all our work. The, the music and pretty- and this time. Even Chase was like, I want to work really close with Lex and Luis because I don't really want to create a score. I want to create an atmosphere. That's wow. exactly what he did. And Absolutely. if you listen to Bestia, it's got these distorted violins mm-hmm. and strange atmosphere sounds that you can't even point what it is. And how he did it together with Lex and Luis, it just created such a, I don't know, such an amazing, stressful like I don't know, it was it was it was yeah. weird watching it because nothing happens as you watch. But that sound right. design and, and the the music that was well, in quote scored, yeah. really added to what Matthias's performance and as you said, what's on the frame. So mm-hmm. it was a really cool collaboration. Like, for them. Awesome. Yeah, it was like taking non diegetic diegetic sounds yeah. in this in this film yeah, and really very kind of experimenting to Chase and Lex and them, really kind of blending it all into. What you what you see on here on screen, right? So fantastic. And then, so was this the the premiere? Have you guys been at other festivals? And also, what is the next step? Oh. No, this is definitely um, not the premiere. We've been mm. showing Bestia for the last year, a little bit less than a year. Okay. Um, but it's it's done amazing. It's played in in it premiered in Sieges. It played in Toronto. One best played short. In oh wow. There. It's yeah. won just recently in New York. Won best editing. Um, it won uh, best cinematography at least four times now, which Jeez. is best super cool. Somewhere too. Best location. Yeah, this is funny. At, at Brooklyn Horror Film Festival, they liked the, the short so much that the the jurors emailed us. They were like, "It was so close in every category that we're gonna add a category because wow. we wanted Bestia <laughs> to win one." And That's we flattering. Were at least yeah. one or two votes away from everything, Sheesh. and they added a an extra category that was called Juror Prize Best Location. <laughs> <laughs> so we're like, we'll take it, sure. Yeah, no, um, it's always. And nice. now it's gonna play at Badass here in Vancouver, and uh, we're nominated for everything. And it was super cool to see Matthias nominated for Best finally. Uh, Performer finally, because we really <laughs> wanted to see him win one like he's been right. nominated quite uh, like I, at I least paid, two three I times and uh <laughs> we're hoping this could be the one he takes home awesome yeah, i think yeah so so yeah i think bestia will show a couple more months and then we'll we'll put it online sounds great yeah and then real quick the location so you you spoke about it in a lot of great ways uh-huh. it was you know invocative of all of these things uh and i heard there was some uh, chaos on oh, set, oh, yeah. everything you can think of. Um, who but lost a who mistake, lost a truck? Matthias, oh. you want to you want to <laughs> share the first mistake that happened that day? What Rainer forgot? He oh, promised oh, you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here we go. <laughs> like like I, I wanted to do the part, so I'm like I, I'm I don't ask him for money or anything. Like I really want to like I know it's gonna be hell. We are gonna suffer. Those are the best kind of actors. I want to do the part, yeah. and I don't need money. Like yeah. okay, <laughs> but the thing, the only thing I asked, I was like, okay, we're gonna be in the woods all day. I want I want a chair, right? So just bring me okay. a folding chair, Rainer. And I get there, there's no chair. Wow. <laughs> the only thing I asked, 
I didn't get it, but it was fun. <laughs> Thank you, Rainer. So that was the first boo boo. <laughs> right. Well, in, in all fairness, it was the chair, the Gore Tex socks that didn't work. Oh, yeah, the waterproof $80. socks. Ooh. They never worked. They said they were supposed to be 100% waterproof and they were wet in like five minutes. So it was $80 down the drain that we couldn't even return after. So Yeah, there was just a lot of things that happened. First, the the winter storm. So there was about five or six feet of snow. So we couldn't even get up. Yeah, yeah. On the first week. (laughs) He told me it was five feet. No. Three feet. Whatever. Lots okay. of snow. <laughs> Lots of we snow. had to cancel it twice. <laughs> because, even made it out. because it was just impossible to get up there. Right. So we canceled it. And then when we came back, uh the the winter here was so strange it all melted away that it, it the the what reason rained? why the and it rained. Mm-hmm. The reason why the short looked the way it did, like with all the tree trunks sticking out of the water. Yeah. It was all the melted snow and the rain. So well, it, it nice. looked Amazing, because the first time we saw it, it was all dry. Well, originally when I went down there, uh, it was like it was the lake frozen mm-hmm. over, right? So yeah, the, the, the stumps were still hanging out, but it was like it was a sheet of ice you could walk across. Sheesh. And again, by the time we came back again, just before we were shooting, it completely melted and, and the lake turned into a lake, right? Mm-hmm. It wasn't frozen anymore, so all the water had come up shore. Like you could have walked so far out before, and now all the water had melted. But it ended up actually working out to our advantage because uh, we didn't have to go so far out, but it was super swampy. <laughs> like trying to lug equipment down there and, yeah, that you know, a whole You want to tell them about the truck? Oh, yeah. And our <laughs> truck that had all the crafty and catering stuff in mm-hmm. there. Um, my good friend Dan, who helped transport some of our crew members down, he had a little Jimmy Blazer that uh, he managed to get through that we could lug off you know, half of our stuff without having to track like three kilometers down to the actual spot on where we pond, need to film. Yeah. Right. So on the way back, we, we finished that location, that that specific scene, and we were walking back and he was he was telling behind us, let us, uh, everybody that was on foot kind of cross this, this massive puddle that, you know, mm. <laughs> <laughs> big, big trucks should be really going through. Well, he decided that he could make it back and... You know, he he went in nose first, and next thing you know, his the half the, the half the car got submerged in water, and basically what we ended up doing oh. was um, hydro locking the engine, and he got how, halfway in the middle of this this massive puddle, and it just stalled out, and then mm. Gigi's freaking out. You saying, can hear the my food. voice. The crafty. The crafty. <laughs> so he's sitting there gurgling away, trying to start it up, and you know it was like ten minutes or something like that. We're all watching them because they're like, need to get, nothing. Like, yeah. need to get you out. And then, yeah, all of a sudden it just started back up and he putted right out and was like, oh my God. Because, yeah, if he if we, so we would have gotten stuck, geez. we would have had he to was get so somebody stoked. else down to <laughs> give him a toe out and we would have lost our food. Just everything and was crazy on that location. That was, uh, that was probably like, like the weather the and everything. But it was so much fun. And I think it awesome. really helped Matthias' character. <laughs> oh, yeah, it worked. Yeah, because there, no, there was no. It worked. There was no. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and there was no electricity. We had no no generators. It was mm-hmm. all you know stands and flags, flags and the and camera and what we had to yeah, to go with that. And yeah, we were pretty much all fighting the light. You know, it was wow. February, mid, like late February. We were shooting right, so we were fighting. The, Started the, four a.m. call, finished at yeah, five p.m. Yeah, we finished at five. So we yeah. did a twelve hour a day, right? It took actually we spent more time driving, right? Almost exactly the same amount of time driving as we did shooting, if you want to kind of like compare the, the amount of time. So it wasn't actually that much shooting. We had to work really fast and work with the light, right? So it was our, it was our little mini revenant for the day. Right. So. <laughs> and then uh, to wrap everything up, because Luchagor focuses on genre films and a lot of horror, what is the scariest movie you have seen? Start with Gigi. Oh, for me, it was definitely The Exorcist. When it came back out in theaters, mm-hmm. I think it was... 1999 or right. something like that. Uh, that was the first scary movie I begged my mom to take me. I was like, I'm going to be a two-digit number next month. I'm going to be 10 years old. Like, take me. I can do it. <laughs> oh, boy. And I was like, okay. Do you want to get scared? Sure. And so she took me and my, um, and my cousin. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I couldn't sleep for a v- mm-hmm. very long time. I got a real taste of what traumatized really is with wow. the exorcist. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'd have to say... Yeah. <laughs> Bambi. <laughs> Bambi, yeah. <laughs> it's like, why? No, no. I, um, I, my dad showed me Aliens, the second one, mm. the James Cameron mm-hmm. one, when I was about like five. Oh, like four or five. So, yeah, it scared the living shit out of me. Yeah. Uh, and then another one, I, I just, 
I was older, but I still haven't finished watching it. Is Event Horizon? I don't know why. Oh. Some of that movie. Dude, that's so scary. That, that, that movie is messed up. It's messed up. I, I don't know. I yeah. just I, I haven't had the urge to finish it off, and I don't yeah. know why. But it's just there's something. This rawness. This you know, it's a sci-fi film, but there's just. I don't know. Okay. It's really gripping, and I, don't, I just, I got I to gotta finish it off. Nice. You know, I got to right. be a bitch anymore. For well, me, it was, uh, the movie, I don't know if you remember Fire in the Sky. <laughs> Fire in the Sky, absolutely. The alien abduction. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember my parents were watching it, and me and my little brother were like, oh, we want to watch it. like, no, no, no. And we just could hear, hear the mm-hmm. screaming. And yeah. then one day they went to work, right? And then we watched it together, and like we're like, oh, my God, I'm not sleeping again, right? <laughs> right. It was so scary, man. That movie, Fire in the Sky, remember? Awesome. I, remember. I like that movie. It's good. Well, cool. Well, thank you guys thank so you. much. Thank you. Uh, the film is Bestia, and I will put all the links to Butchagor and Gigi and Martin and Rainer. Martin. <laughs> Matias. My, what am I doing? Uh, that's his, that's his Hashtag new name. El Matador. Martin. Right. Uh, I will put all of the links in the show notes below. So <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you again. Thank, thank you so you. much. So for this episode of About to Review, covering the 2018 Vancouver Short Film Festival, I have been your host, that guy named John, and we will see you next time. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat.